with Victor Okafo. I'm the head of the Department of Anthropology and African American Studies. Thanks for making our time to join us today. I welcome you warmly to this afternoon's Black History Month program, which is meant to shed constructive light upon and expand our knowledge and understanding of a phenomenon which, in some circles, is viewed as a continuing light upon the accomplishments of our democracy. We also hope that today's dialogue may generate ideas by which we, as a campus community, can more adroitly categorize, deal with, and resolve issues of a racist nature. Notably, this year marks the 400th anniversary of the first documented ship of 20 African captives to the English-speaking colony of what was to become Virginia on a Dutch ship that ferried from the West African coast. This shipment occurred in August 1619. This is why the year 1619 holds a special meaning in African-American history. This February 2019 is also especially significant in the history of Eastern Michigan University itself, for it marks the 50th anniversary of black students' takeover of EMU's Pierce Hall on February 20, 1969. Their takeover of Pierce Hall in 1969 was among the set of actions designed to pressurize the leadership of EMU at that time to initiate reforms and changes that would enhance racial diversity, improve the campus climate, and promote inclusive learning at this institution. That city in Appears Hall in 1969 occurred in the context of the national civil rights movement that was in vogue in the United States during the 1960s led by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Across the campuses of the United States, there was a campus-based student protest that mirrored the general civil rights movement of that time period. The campus movement was aimed at bringing about educational reforms that would usher in inclusive and diversified higher educational learning. Here at EMU, the student protests, which were spearheaded by the Black Student Association in conjunction with community members, were instrumental to bringing about programmatic educational reforms, such as the creation of an African American Studies program in 1965, which eventually got elevated to a department in 1990. Of course, ever since, our department has undergone a series of transformations, including are renaming of our unit as the Department of Africology and African American Studies in 2013, and our establishment of a Master of Arts in Africology and African American Studies effective from fall 2018, the first of its kind in the state of Michigan. The above record of an especially socially transformative period of the 1960s, particularly in the realm of education, is all the more important at this juncture in the life of our institution as we dialogue about the future and configurations of the constituent organs of our university. For we must never forget that the rather small, spatial, and epistemological space that our africological enterprise occupies within the academy, locally and across the larger academy itself, was born out of a womb of a long and arduous struggle. I believe that it is also a pertinent that we place on record the fact that our mission this afternoon dovetails with the praxis character of the academic project known as Black Studies or Africology and African American Studies, amongst other nomenclatural manifestations of an African-centered, structured, and critical exploration analysis and synthesis of the historical evolution and contemporary nature of the global black experience with particular and pivotal emphasis 
upon the African American experience in the United States. The prizes character of Africology and African American studies was brilliantly elucidated by one of the luminaries and founders of the discipline, distinguished Professor Molana Karinga, in the following words, and I quote, the struggle for black studies originated in San Francisco in the 60s, with the students demanding a relevant education. By relevant education, we mean, first of all, education that can serve the interests of our community, the country, and humanity because we were operating on the fundamental fact that as African culture teaches us, that knowledge is never simply knowledge for knowledge. Knowledge is for human sake. The question is, what are we going to do with our knowledge? How can we use this knowledge to improve the human condition? Black studies is important because it is fundamentally a contribution to humanity, understanding itself, unquote. Dr. Keringa concludes by saying as follows, and I quote, America cannot be understood simply by its best documents. You understand the society also by how it treats its most vulnerable people, unquote. Our purpose this afternoon is also in alignment with the educational vision of the United Nations as enunciated in its Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. As the UN put it, quote, education shall be directed towards the full development of the human personality and the strengthening of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. It shall promote understanding, tolerance, and friendship among all nations, racial or religious groups, unquote. And so, we are gathered here today in order to weigh in on and attempt to define in layman's terms and dissect a social malaise which, in the view of many people across the ideological and political spectrum, contributes sometimes rather silently to undermining the life prospects and social advancement potentials of its victims. As one news commentator put it recently, and I quote, it is true that hate exists and it is part of the human condition, unquote. And so we are here to discuss and get some clarity on a social problem which on the one hand has almost become a cliche and is probably invoked countless of times per day both in private and public settings, but which on the other hand remains somewhat murky and difficult to pin down in justiciable terms. We have assembled a diverse group of experts in their own rights to help us wrap our heads around this vexed topic and social ill known as racism. In a short while, you'll get to find out who they are and why we are lucky to have them here today with us. You probably have noticed that we have available for you today light refreshments on the table behind. Please feel free to help yourself to it as the dialogue proceeds. Those of you who would like to receive LBC credit for this event should remember to pick up and fill out an LBC credit form and give it back uh, to the reception table on your way out at the end of the program. For now, ladies and gentlemen, let me bring to the podium our Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Dana Hale for her words of welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, I want to welcome you to today's panel discussion. This is a key event in EMU's Black History Month observance. It's also further evidence of the high quality of programming that's provided to us through the Department of Africology and African American Studies, and I'm very grateful to everyone who made this uh, event today possible. And I want to extend, of course, a special thank you to, uh, to Victor for all of his hard work and, and leadership. Um, the topic of today's discussion brings together distinguished presenters whose expertise in activism spans the arts, the practice of law, education, government, criminal justice, health administration, 
institutional human resources and the academic disciplines of history, African American history, and women's studies. We have a lot of breadth here today. And that's indicative, I think, uh, 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 of, of, of our topic, which is pointedly posed as a question, what is racism? Uh, that is by no means an abstract question. It's a bold question, it's a provocative question that implicitly acknowledges that there can be no single answer. And it's a question that very much compels the political urgencies of our moment globally, as a nation, as a state, as a culture, and as a university. Recent events and public discursive flashpoints from uh, the battle over funding for a border wall, to the clean water health crisis in Flint, to the revelation of black face performance in Virginia, Governor Ralph Northam's personal history, to incidents that have occurred right here on campus all serve as stark reminders that the legacies of xenophobia, Jim Crow, minstrelsy, and lynching are with us still today as part of our embodied history. And while the non-stop commercial traffic and media scandal often seems to risk diverting <coughs> our attentions from the structural systemic dimensions of racial discrimination, there is no doubt that racism is essentially of the body. It is something deeply and intimately connected to the day-to-day -day embodied experiences of people of color. It highlights also one of the points conveyed by the BLM movement, Black Lives Matter, captured in the double meaning of matter itself, suggesting both importance and value, but also materiality, the flesh, conditions of embodiment with real life and death circumstances. The question of racism asks us to confront the contradictions of our citizen contract just as it seeks to interpret and interrogate our histories, the sum total of stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. But at the same time, I believe that it is also a question born of a persistent faith in the promise of social justice, in the hope of a better future. And it is in that spirit and with great uh, uh, honor that I now turn the podium over to Dr. Tony Preston and on who will introduce the panel of experts. Thank you to all of you for being here. Greetings. Greetings. So good to see so many of you here on this beautiful Thursday afternoon. And uh, so my name is Dr. Tony Presley Sanon, and I teach in the Department of Agriculture and African American Studies. This afternoon, I have the distinguished honor of um, presenting our wonderful panelists. Um, to my far right, we have Dr. Imelda Hunt. Um, Dr. Imelda Hunt has taught African American Studies for more than 25 years. She holds a PhD in African culture from Bowling Green State University with a major in African American culture and black popular culture. Um, she also holds a master's degree in African American theater and American culture with an emphasis on African American culture from Bowling Green State University. Um, and finally, she's the recipient of many, many awards and scholarships for her artistic talents. She's a very gifted writer and theater person. Um, to my far left, we have Dr. Mary Elizabeth Murphy, who's a, an associate professor here at EMU, associate professor of history. And she teaches a course on the history of African American women. She holds a PhD from the University of Maryland and an AB from Mount Holyoke College. Um, her latest work, which just hit the presses in 2018, is Jim Crow Capital. Women and Black Freedom Struggles in Washington, D.C., 1920-1945. And we have attorney Mark Fancher. Uh, Mr. Fancher is the staff attorney for the Racial Justice Project of the ACLU of Michigan. 
Through his work, he addresses racially disproportionate rates of incarceration, racial discrimination against public school students of color, racial profiling, attacks on the democratic rights of communities of color, and abusive police practices. Mr. Bancher has played leadership roles in the National Conference of Black Lawyers for numerous years. He has also lectured across the country and written extensively on issues that include the U.S. military presence in Africa, political repression in the U.S., and the land and resource rights of traditional indigenous communities. Next up, we have Dr. Mark Higby, who is Professor of History here at EMU. He teaches a course on African American history. Um, he earned his PhD in American history from Columbia University. His dissertation was on the politics of W.E.B. Du Bois, and his study of Du Bois's work still informs Dr. Higby's work as a citizen and a teacher. He has taught at EMU since 1994, when EMU hired him to teach courses on African American history. So he's been here a, long time. a while. <laughs> he's particularly interested in what is often called the central problem of American history, how racism and white supremacy have shaped all of the history of the United States. Later this year, W.W. Um, w. Horton and Sons will publish his book, Frederick Douglass, Slavery in the Constitution, 1845. Mr. Mark Brown is a political correct. I'm sorry, Mr. Eric Brown, excuse me. A political affair is a political affairs blogger. He's a graduate of EMU with a degree in health administration. Mr. Brown has worked the last nine years as a human resources professional. He's a native of Detroit and has spent a portion of his professional career in Lansing and Lansing, Michigan, sorry, in Charlotte, North Carolina. He is a staunch supporter of EMU and has served on numerous committees advisory boards, and is a former president of the EMU Alumni Association. Mr. Brown is a 2018 recipient of the EMU Alumni Achievement Award and currently serves as the visionary slash creator of the 5K run slash race for literacy that will have its inaugural race later this year. And last but definitely not least, we have attorney Robin L. McCoy who is actually from the Ann Arbor Ypsilanti area. She graduated at the top of her class in actually honors in anthropology from the University of Chicago in 1996 and obtained her JD from the University of Michigan Law School in 2000. Ms. McCoy is a member of the Board of the Democratic Women's Caucus, the Black Women Lawyers of Michigan, the Wolverine Bar Association, the Wayne County Criminal Defense Bar, the National Bar Association, the State Bar of Michigan, and the Washtenaw County Bar Association. She has planned, facilitated, and organized presentations on what to do when stopped by the police and the expungement and federal pardon process across the state. <coughs> Currently, Ms. McCoy lectures part-time at e in EMU's Department of Anthropology and African American Studies, where she teaches an upper division course on law in the African American experience. Please welcome our distinguished guests. Thank you very much. At this stage, I'm going to call upon the panelists themselves to uh, give you their own opening statements. Uh, you can do that in any order that you wish to do so. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman, for allowing me to be a part of this. Very important topic. I think it's something that we all need to be organized about when we deal with it. What is racism? Yes, it is defined as prejudice, discrimination, antagonism directed against someone of a different race based on the belief that one's own race is superior. Then there are the three levels of racism. Institutionalized, 
personally many media and, and internalized. Institutional life racism centers on a historical insults, structural barriers, inaction in face of need, societal norms, biological determinism, and unearned privilege. Personally mediated racism are those that which are intentional or unintentional, acts of commission, acts of omission, maintaining structural barriers and the condoning of societal norms. Then you have internalized racism, which reflects systems of privilege, reflects societal values, eroded individual sense of value, and undermines collective um, action. However, racism is much more than just that. It is not something that one is born into practicing. It is, a, it, is a, it is a learned behavior, being taught by those who subsequently have some superiority complex intertwined with ignorance. People often confuse white privilege with racism, but that has more to do with unfettered arrogance. Imagine being the only black person in a college classroom, and those occupying the same space as you see you as that token Negro. Not knowing you've achieved the highest scores on every exam in the class. Their ignorance and shallowness is the epitome of racism. What about that white cop who fears the skin he sees more than the situation he finds himself in? And then decides to shoot first and is somehow able to successfully explain away his actions later because a dead man cannot talk. That is racism. So is the white cop in a predominantly black city forcing a young woman to walk home in frigid weather as he foolishly records it and posts it to social media as to prove his dominance over her while catching urban lingo and relaying it to those who's watching it and beseeching the upcoming celebration of Black History Month. Racism is a white person only to remember that he dressed up in black face or wore paint or wore a pointy hood, while at the same time he somehow remembers portraying an acceptable Negro in our society in some dance contest, even though a said white man doesn't look like he could do a basic one-two step and in no way in hell would he be able to do the moonwalk. Racism is the failure of so many white people to grasp and understand that we were forced immigrants into this country 400 years ago and built this land for free. But the white man has an unmitigated gall to act like we owe them something for wanting equal rights in a, labor, in a level playing field. Racism is the ignorance of so many that think that because the N-word is so prevalently used by black stories black that it validates their negative attitudes that they ignorantly feel that we hate one another. What is racism can usually be defined as ignorance of one who espouses such a view based on a tone definite of getting away with saying I have a black friend, while never announcing who that said black friend or friends are, and never being able to see anything black other than wearing a suit or driving a black car. Blacks in the South fearing and being skeptical of medical care after being used as pawns in what we now know as the Tuskegee experiment. The reservations that many have about getting certain shots while choosing to self-medicate and or treat themselves based on all wives' tales directly tied to racism. The true sign of racism is the shallowness of a person derived from simply saying, I do have a black friend. Pretty much that's a racist statement in and of itself. However, it is used to try and validate that they are not racist because they have a black friend, but they're too blind to see how racist they truly are. Thank you. Um, especially to talk about a subject that has been with me since I was a little girl. <laughs> so, and it is still complex and it's still perplexing. So, I'm going to kind of give the definition that I usually, because I teach um, Africology 244, uh, we have a working definition in my classroom. And so, I want to talk a little bit about that. Race, as I said, is very complex because it's had had a biological meaning that is refuted by current um, anthropologists and most other scholars. And it simultaneously has a cultural meaning which is very much alive and operational. Part of that meaning 
according to some of the authors that we read, how real is race, that race is a way of socially dividing humans into a stratified system. For my purpose in my classes, we focus on the cultural meaning, that is, the way in which race has been constructed and used to socially rank humans for the purpose of maintaining power. Is that not, not right, my students who are sitting out there? We talk about power and relationship of power. The words derived from race, racism, races, and racialization are equally complex because that concept of race is socially constructed and constantly shifting. And therefore, it is, its derivative words are also fluid and complex in their meanings and associations to differently position people. Words such as colorblind society, multiculturalism, Hispanic but not of black descent. Many people have been taught that racism is a belief or attitude or discriminatory behavior <coughs> on the basis of visible racial features, often encapsulated and including in the term skin color. It is often pointed out that racism can reside in the individual or in the groups of people. In the simple view of racism, anyone can perpetrate racism regardless of his or her position in society. For example, my black students who have European friends will say, we went to a store which was owned by a black man to buy a 40 ounce and my white friend was told no and asked to leave. They believe that this is to be racism. The more complex view of racism adds further elements that help to clarify how racism operates in society is often in invisible ways. Additionally, elements included in the idea of racism occurs not only in individuals and groups, but also in institutions. Thus, an entire institution can operate in ways that result in racism. In fact, a whole political, I'm sorry, getting some feedback here? <laughs> okay, a whole entire police department can operate as a systemic at the systemic level of racial profiling. More complex views often distinguish racism from individual prejudice and complex, and complex definitions. For example, when we think about racism, we have someone named Harris Delladora who have looked at racism and looked at it in its power structure, saying that racism and prejudice equals, plus that racism, racial prejudice and power equals racism. So I'm often looking at the life of Malcolm X and I look at his life and I look at the beginning of his life when his mother was grieving for the loss of her father and the rejection of the insurance policy by the white insurance agent and the white social agency that refused to and assessed her ability to take care of her children. All of those prejudices destroyed that family and institutionalized both the children and the mother. This formula is racism, racial prejudice plus power is used in many diverse training and anti-racist seminars and workshops. So when we talk about racism, now we have a formula. I don't know if it's my best formula, but it's the formula that I am operating with now to try to understand this complex problem. Thank you. Uh, you know, the um, question of racism uh, is one that begs the question of uh, what about the notion of race itself? 
and for many who consider this subject casually, uh, then there is an automatic presumption that the issue of race, uh, the concept of race, is one that is inherent to the human family, that uh, human beings have always been race conscious, that they have always focused on it, and that they have always had prejudices of some kind or another based on color. Even a casual review of ancient texts will reveal that to be untrue, starting with, of course, the document that is available to most people, uh, the Bible itself. You can go from cover to cover in the Bible and find very few references to skin color, if any. And the reason that you don't find it is because in ancient times, the notion of skin color and race was as insignificant as the color of one's hair or the color of one's eyes. It would have been as odd for them in those times to have made note of race as it would be for us if I were a journalist and I were covering this meeting. And I wrote a story that recorded uh, the number of people who had brown hair, the number of people who had blonde hair, the number of people who had brown eyes. It's of no significance to us because it carries no social significance generally. So the question really isn't so much the question of race and color and what difference that makes. The question is, when did it begin to make a difference and why? And when we look at that question, we don't even get to the question of racism as a word. We get to, a question, to the question of the emergence of a notion of white supremacy. Uh, because white supremacy is what made race an issue for all of humanity from the, 14, the late 1400s up to the present. You know, people of goodwill uh, understood that human beings were human beings prior to that time. If you look at the ancient text of the Greeks, even though Greece is frequently given credit for the birth of modern civilization, the Greeks themselves attributed much of what they knew to Africa. They talked in glowing terms about the brilliance of Africans. You can look in the 1200s and 1300s at the University of saint Correa and the fact that it was the Harvard of its time in West Africa, and that it attracted scholars from around the world, that it had a, a library that contained volumes that focused on many different disciplines, and the finest professors were there, and that people respected it, and respected them. You even look at uh, art that was created uh, during the Renaissance period, and you see uh, social scenes that are portrayed in, in uh, Europe where you see people who are from, clearly from Africa and other places where dark-skinned people populated the earth, who are dressed in their fire, are intermingling with people of Europe. And so this question of white supremacy is one which was born in the late 1400s, and it had everything to do with the fact that people of goodwill did not buy into the idea of people conquering other people's territories, of enslaving other human beings, and those profiting from these enterprises, these newly emerging enterprises, had to justify and rationalize uh, their treatment of other human beings in this way. And so basic notions of people from Africa, people from the Americas, people from the Caribbean, people from other regions of the world as savages, as pagans, as, as heathens, as cannibals, these were ideas which were pushed incessantly in order to make people in Europe understand and accept the idea that engaging in this type of barbaric activity was something that was not only acceptable, but something that was morally necessary in order to bring these savages into close proximity with civilized and basic and human, and human uh, civilized humanity. So this question of white supremacy must be at the core of the discussion today because it really defines and sets in motion all of the questions and the problems that we have regarding race in a more modern context. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I want to thank Drs. Victor Kofar and Tony Presley Sinon for inviting me to present today. Studying the history of Africans in the United States over five centuries demonstrates the ways that race is a historical construction in the United States. 
Certainly, there is no question that men and women of African descent have faced persistent patterns of discrimination, racism, and inequality. But employing the discipline of history demonstrates the ways that these patterns can change over time or not change over time. This year, 2019, as Dr. Kopar mentioned, marks the 400th anniversary of the first Africans who arrived in Jamestown, Virginia. When Africans first arrived, their status was fluid. Scholars are unable to determine whether they were indentured servants or whether they were slaves. An African man named Antonio and Negro achieved his freedom, married, changed his name from Antonio and Negro to Anthony Johnson, owned property, and sued in court. But when white indentured servants rose up to protest their status in 1675, legislators in the colony linked blackness with slavery and codified a set of laws to ensure that Africans would be enslaved for generations. But then following the Civil War in the 1860s, African Americans banded together with white allies to create interracial democracy from the ashes of slavery. Black men voted, served in local and national political offices, and participated in politics. Black women also participated in politics and publicly testified in state legislatures about sexual violence. This period of interracial democracy was unprecedented, as no other slave society gave its former slaves full citizenship rights. While these patterns of interracial democracy disappeared with the advent of Jim Crow and racial segregation in the 1890s, the memories of a previous era inspired a new generation to rise up and restore their full citizenship rights. These two examples demonstrate that race is first and foremost a social construct, but it is also deeply connected with the social, political, cultural, and economic contexts in which it operates. Centering the experiences of African American women in the United States reveals less change and more continuity. From the moment that black women were enslaved, their bodies were never their own. The legacy of rape and sexual violence persists in the United States to the present day, and the intersections of racism and sexism still render it largely invisible. Activists in the United States have never been able to banish the academic epidemic of racism in the United States. The black freedom struggle in the United States in the 20th century did secure legal equality for some, but the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965 did not signal the end to racist patterns and behaviors. Events in our current political moment indicate the persistence of interpersonal racism, whether it is white Americans calling the police on black bodies, or governors in Virginia admitting to wearing blackface in the 1980s. But now more than ever, institutional racism in our schools, our prisons, our medical care, cities, and neighborhoods demonstrates the ways that this powerful force continues to shape American life. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Attorney Rob McCoy. I want to thank Professor Okafor for inviting me to be here. I want to thank the panelists for being here. Um, Cool. I'm, I'm teaching a class on law and the African American experience, and this has been a really exciting process. I feel like I'm back in school again. Um, I'm just soaking up all of this, this knowledge, and um, I'm going to give my disclaimer, though. As I am working part time here at EMU, my, my opinions are my opinions, and they do not reflect the opinions of the university. So I'm just going to let y'all know straight up. So, uh, I stand here as the fifth generation uh, descendant of a slave of James McCoy, of slaves, and uh, when we talk about 1619, you know, that it really, it, 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 it evokes a powerful emotion within me. I've been following, uh, you know, I'm looking at Virginia, Jamestown, Virginia, August 20th is the anniversary of when the first slaves were, uh, uh, 1619, so 2019, this year, 400 years, and I'm looking at the website, I see that there's a lot of activities, going on, uh, as is indicated in my bio, my background is anthropology, and so I'm a, I'm a museum junkie, and I know that I'll be making my way out there 
Uh, as I started this class, uh, coming in and teaching law and the African American experience, I could not, obviously I had to talk about the fact that the first slaves were brought here in 1619, and here we are 400 years later, and we're talking about this question about what is racism? And I'm like, there's, there's several ways, there's a lot of different ways you can come at that, unpack that, you know. As a black person in this society, you look at systemic racism, you look at racism in the, the education system, in, and I work as an educational advocate, primarily in the city of Detroit, so I'm seeing that firsthand, the experience. I'm, I'm working to prevent the school to prison pipeline, uh, to prevent uh, expulsions and suspensions of, of black children, you know. You can have it in colleges and universities. You can have it in situations where professors, maybe they will, or, or even in the elementary school, uh, they see two, two black students interacting with each other, and they interpret certain, they interpret things a certain way, and they call the police. Whereas when I was younger, if the teachers saw students fighting, they would come in and they would break up the fight and they would work it out. And then you wouldn't have a situation where, uh, the, the, you know, I work at the juvenile courts and it's, the, it's a, a, the just us system. You have a disproportionate number of black kids that I'm working with that they fight, they, they get in trouble, and it's, they don't get a chance to grow out of uh, their immaturity. Uh, they end up having a record. I, at, at Newton Law School, uh, one of my professors was Gail Kamazar, uh, who was a white man who talked about how he grew up in, in New York, and when he was younger, he did things, and he said that the, the white, predominantly white police would give him warnings and gave him opportunities to grow out of his immaturity. Statistics have shown that the adult brain does not fully mature until the age of 25, and, and, and yet we know this, you know, there's, there's also the Harvard study on implicit bias, and uh, what we've had in the legal field is we've had Dr. Kimberly Papignon come out and, and do workshops with us where you take the Harvard uh, test, and you see that we're all impacted by, by prejudices, that, uh, and, and, and how, you know, she, she does these programs, she talks about in the, in the business world, in the field of education, medical, and the law, for me, it's very relevant in the field of law. So when they they, they talk about these this uh, the brain scans, they look at people's <coughs> brains and they show them pictures. They show pictures of black people who could be light skin to brown skin to dark skin and different features, and they, they show that people have a reaction and they show that there's a disparity in the way that the judges sentence people based on their expressions. They also have shown that there are white people. They have white people with different expressions. They, they can be treated accordingly based on their expressions. I mean, when I, what I do is I, and part of why I do my workshops on what to do when stopped by the police and also expungements is because I'm trying to, if you're, I've been practicing law 17 years, and if you're, you know, as my other brothers and sisters in the law will tell you, you get burnt out when you see the system, you see the disparity. You see, I primarily see black people, I see also poor white people, and what I, you know, what I do with my clients, I try to help them, give them tips, prevention, uh, make sure that we can do everything they can to try to navigate the, the unjust system. And so, uh, again, when you're talking about what is racism, as I said, you know, I can give my own experience as a black person, and you look at the experience of brown people here, you look at what we're here now, 2019, we're talking about uh, a lot of the racism and xenophobia, we're talking about uh, creating borders and and excluding people from, from the, uh, the American dream, even though the indigenous were here, indigenous people predated Columbus. They were here, this is their land. And then and, and you think about uh, the context of race, we, we're in a, a society where you have people that are Asian and they're considered minorities. We, we refer to Asian, black, brown as minorities, but then you look at the world population and it's four, four billion. Uh, Asian, and some people would say that the future is Asian, I would say the present is Asian. You look at the statistics, you, it's, it's Asian, it's black, it's Hispanic, and, and uh, I think it's important, you know, we get into these situations where people have discussions of, of racism and, and they, 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 they want to be very cautious and, and they don't want to really talk about what's, what, what's, where they're coming from, and I, I would say that, that that's not the way to go about it. That's why it's good to do the Harvard Implicit Bias Test where we look at all of us. All of us are affected by prejudice and are affected by bias. And when we look at racism, we look at the, the issue is, as, as Dr. Pond talked about in the traditional definition is that 
it, the distinction is that there's when you have prejudice plus power, when you're in a position of power, that's what makes the difference. That's where you see, as I said, you know, we talked about in our class, we've talked about Brown versus the Board of Education and how there's supposed to be equality in education, and yet here we are in 2019 and there's still disparity. There's still, for, for, for black and brown children, you just, you don't see that. You look at, uh, when I was at the University of Michigan, we had a lawsuit where we had a, a, a woman that was suing us and saying that uh, there was reverse discrimination. And I, and I looked at my class, we had a class of 27 African Americans who went to predominantly black schools, white schools. We worked all our butts off to get where we needed to get, and then we have somebody uh, coming from a class of uh, a group that actually has benefited from affirmative action, which was a program that was designed to make up for past discriminations. They've benefited more than, than, than the original group that the, the programs were designed for. These programs were designed for African Americans. And so when I look at this definition of racism, uh, as I said, it's, 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 a, it's a heavy issue to unpack. When I look at, I just look at all these ironies and, you know, I was here two years ago, we were talking about, I was asked to be a guest lecturer and talk about racism and there were some issues on campus with graffiti. Now y'all got some stuff going on with a dial. Y'all had a person going on, putting, a, putting a, a black dial and, you know, I've talked to my students about this, about the trauma um, that they've experienced. I mean, I, I can only, for me, I can tell you, I had trauma as a black student at the University of Michigan and, and having to think about the Supreme Court looking at my grades while I'm in school. And what I did as a, as a student is I said, okay, we're gonna do some protests and rallies, but the, the main thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna focus, we're gonna study, we're gonna go out there so we can be successful, so we can help other people. So that's why I say you young folks here, you see there's, we got, we got a hot mess going on in this society. We've got, we got a white supremacist president. It's like I'm in my class and we, we're, we're talking about uh, the Constitution and the founding fathers and, and how, you know, and some of the materials, they talk about how our, this country was founded on racism. You know, they put certain things in there, equality of men in the Constitution, but at the time, they, 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 that wasn't the case for, it wasn't the experience of the black slaves or the Native Americans that were here. They, they, it, was a, it was inconsistencies. And then as we heard about the history of this country, it's, we're, we're going in, there's, uh, there's circles that are going on. There's a, it's a cyclical thing going on. It's like we move forward, then we move backwards. And it's insanity. You've got, you have the Civil War, and then you have Reconstruction. Blacks and whites are coming together. They're improving things. And then you've got the Jim Crow laws coming in. You've got the Southern strategy. Then you've got, you know, we have, pro, you have Brown versus Board of Education, another period of Reconstruction. We have, again, blacks and whites coming together. And then you have, uh, Michelle Alexander talks about this in the new Jim Crow. You have laws that are put into place to oppress black people. And I would submit, as I said, most of my clients are black, but I tell my white clients, I'm like, look, you know what, you caught in the system. You know, what Martin Luther King said is what affects one directly affects us all indirectly. So I let my white clients know, I said, you realize you caught up in the system, like you, you in the criminal justice system, and you, we, we, we uh, incarcerate more people than any other uh, country on the planet. You're caught up in laws that were designed to oppress, oppress black people, but you're also being oppressed as well because our system is sick. It's a, it, Dr. Francis Cress Wesley talks about this. It's racism is a mental illness, it's a sickness, and it's something that I believe can be cured. You know, they've had, uh, I've looked at the materials and I, I've seen when Jane Elliott, she came to U of M last year, or I think it was a couple years ago, she has exercises that she, she will do with students and the, the Brown Eye, uh, Blue Eye Project. And it's, I think that if we're gonna get to the, the answer to the solution of, the, of ending racism and fixing the problem, we've got to have dialogues. I think everybody should be taking a class. Everybody should be taking a class on, uh, um, the black experience, y'all should know about them. I mean, y'all need to know about the Hispanic experience, y'all need to be taking Spanish, y'all need to be knowing about the Asian experience, the culture. We all need to know about each other's culture so we can and have that dialogue so that we can understand how to engage. Right now, I would say, as I look at TV and the images that are put out there, it's, it's images of, of white people and it is, it's, it's about white supremacy. And so, how do we fix that? We, we've got to look to our, our teachers and our scholars out there. We've got Tim Weiss out there. And we've got to have that dialogue. We've got to have those difficult conversations. And we've got to, like with the Harvard study, they, they, you can do the programming, and then you can work to reprogram yourself. And I mean, even this morning, you look at the crazy thing with Jesse Smollett. Everybody was caught up 
watching what was going on with him, and we're on a trip, you know, I mean, people are posting, like, racism and homophobia is wrong, and then now it's, we're, we're being, it's like, we gotta re, we redirect it, because it's, look, it's going another way. And so, and, and it's, it's, to me, it speaks to the fact that we need cultural sensitivity, we need trauma counseling all throughout the land in order to heal uh, this issue of racism, and as I said, reparation. So, thank you. Thank, thank you, Emma. Am I, can you hear me? I want to say ditto to everything all my distinguished panelists said. They took a lot of my notes. I had prepared notes. Well, they, they just had similar ideas. They didn't take anything from me. Um, I'm not one of those white folks. So, I'll <laughs> so um, I've been in Eastern for a long time, and as I was coming into the building today, I was reminded of and a conversation I had in this building in one of the off room off rooms like this in the late 1990s, about 20 years ago, about five years of my career, with the provost of the university, which had been arranged by my then dean and department head, because they did not think I should go ahead with an idea of developing a course on the history of racism in the United States. I thought it would be too controversial. So they talked to the provost. And I was talked down from that idea. Because what they were going to prove it, well, first of all, and it's, you know, it's hard to say no to the provost. And the provost was a very nice guy. And the department I was not a very nice guy. And my department, no, the dean was a very nice guy. I, I cannot say that about my department yet. Who no longer is at the university, but is still employed elsewhere. Um, So I've come overcome by that memory, just coming to the building, like, oh wow, things are different. Things are really different. Students in my classes, in American history and in African American history, uh, know more when they come in the door to my class than they used to know about what is white privilege and how come white normality is not universal. What is racism? What is bigotry? They have a far more deeper understanding of that. Uh, and so you now I was sitting here looking at you, and so many familiar faces, familiar students. Um, I'm not teaching this semester because I'm on medical leave about a month ago. I had a stroke. Uh, so uh, I don't even know. But I, I, I was lucky. I had kind of stroke that didn't kill me and did not, as far as I can tell, debilitate me. Uh, so I, I did bring a few professoral props. First of all, for the white people in the room who do not know of how to do actively anti-racist things, I suggest wearing a Black Lives Matter button. And I've got a couple to give away. I also have a little bibliography on books on racism. Uh, and I have a book, a really good book by a great historian, Carol Anderson, uh, to give away as well. There, this is an honor of so just come and get it if you want it, if you want the button. Uh, so, and the, the key thing about racism is that it changes greatly over time. It's adaptive, it's, it's, it's powerful. It's been here, as my colleagues have said, for 400 more years, and more years, and we're coming up with the 400th anniversary of the introduction of slaves into what's now the United States. A hundred years before that was the first Africans brought to the New World in Brazil and the, and the Caribbean islands. Uh, so it's a it's a what the boys call the debauchery of the, of the modern age. It's with us. It shapes nearly everything about American society, the, our culture, our politics. Why is Donald Trump in the White House? Because they created the Electoral College in 1787 to protect slave owners. And it's still in the Constitution of the United States. That is why Donald Trump and George W. Bush won the Electoral College elections. They, they lost the majority vote, but the white power structure is still trying to be ghost of people like James Madison who I love in so many ways, and he was a disgusting racist bigot in so many other ways. He's the author of the Bill of Rights, the main author of the Constitution. So, it's a complicated history. Like, I believe in the Constitution, 
the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment. These are very important ideas, and they're very, very important for the liberation of people of color and this country. But they are mixed up with complicated things. W. B. Du Bois in World War One was interviewed by federal agents. Burst into his office and demanded he explain what does this your group, the NAACP, stand for? The FBI had not been created yet, but it was about to. And W.E.B. Du Bois said, we stand for nothing less than the 100% enforcement of the Constitution of the United States. And what Dr. Du Bois had in mind was the 14th Amendment and the 13th Amendment and the 15th. Black people should be able to vote. Black people are equal. That 14th Amendment, our current occupant of the White House, he thinks he can amend it with an executive order. That is, that's a statement of belief in tyranny. And white supremacy is based on tyranny. I think in many ways the term white supremacy is superior to, to racism in terms of describing a system a lot, lots of times, the word racism is used in such a general way uh, or, or that it, it seems to lose some of the meaning. Uh, but, but that's just one point. One thing I want to say about the current period of history that we're in, and this is based on the New York Times. These are ideas familiar, but they're in the best, new, current New York Times best-selling book the last six months, uh, White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism by Robin D. Great book, very readable, and it's pretty small. I mean, not as small as you might like, but you know. Uh, uh, D'Angelo lays out, and, and you Google her on YouTube, there's a, a number of short talks that and Robin D'Angelo gives. And I've got the better thing, she's named on this bibliography. D'Angelo lays out the idea that since the victories of the civil rights movement, of the 1960s, the late 1960s, it has become unacceptable for white people to be thought of as being white supremacist. Only bad people are white supremacists. Only bad people are racist. Therefore, I'm not a racist. Therefore, no white person here is a racist. Now, there are some exceptions of people who wear coats and costumes, uh, and there are white evil that is done willfully. What, what that jerk of a human being that hung that doll in that bathroom. That was willful, malicious, hateful act. There's no way around. I don't know, I don't know who the person is. I mean, I don't know that person individually. But the worst kinds of racism are the racism that are carried out by people who deny. I shot that guy, he was running from me, but I'm a police officer, and I shot him in the back because, you know, that's my job. And until the last five years, they would never be brought up to the charges. Um, so there are many, many manifestations of white supremacy, and my colleagues have identified numerous ones, historically and contemporary. But what Robin DiAngelo calls the good, bad binary, Either good people or bad people. And only bad people are racist. Only bad people do bad things to black people to people of color. And they own the only racism that matters is the racism that is done deliberately with the conscious intention of hurting people. Wow, well, that's a pretty high standard. Mortgage companies can't, and banks. Can evict you, deny you a loan? Can we possess your home? As they, in the, the economic crisis of 2008, they did to hundreds of thousands of Americans, predominantly or disproportionately people of color. That's not racism. That's just making a profit. Well, what was slavery? Slavery was making a profit off of black people, off of Africans brought to this rule. The first capital in the American capital system was the human capital of black bodies. 
literally a property in black bodies. Excuse me for going over. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much for those um, scintillating opening statements. You can attest to the fact that um, what we have assembled here is a dynamic group. So, and in fact, they covered uh, lots of areas that uh, are affected by my questions. But I hope that uh, uh, these questions uh, would uh, elicit more answers from them. Uh, by the way, I want you to be aware that you as the audience, we have a chance to pose whatever questions that you may have uh, on your mind. Uh, so after my own round of questions, I will invite uh, you individually to ask questions that you may have. So let me start by asking uh, the following question. In her book, Race and Racism, Professor Caroline Flora Lohmann observes that the term racist is used to refer to an ideology that asserts the inferiority or superiority of races, unquote. This implies that a racist is a person whose views, regards, and treats someone of a different racial categorization as innately inferior. So my question to the panelists is, uh, is this. What is your take on it? Does this reflect your own sense of what makes a person a racist? Or is there more or less to it? You can take that question from any other. Well, I, I think that uh, we, we all can be racist. I can be racist, you can be racist. Everybody can be racist. Uh, but the question is, uh, what difference does it make? Uh, if, if I uh, choose to stand in the middle of the, uh, the campus and declare a war on white people and call for the genocide of white people, to say that I'm going to stand up and I'm going to raise an army uh, to go and wipe out every white person I can find, all right? The, the truth is that while some people would kind of raise an eyebrow, they kind of shrug and keep on walking because they know that within a matter of minutes, if I actually tried to further that plan, that the power of the state would be down on me like a ton of bricks. Uh, I would get nowhere with that. Right? Contrast that with a white person who makes the same kind of pronouncement about some type of a war that they want to wage against uh, people of color. The power of the state might look at that person power of the state might come down on that person, maybe, but it inspires uh, a great deal more fear and concern uh, among the general population because they know uh, that because of institutional structures, history, and the circumstances of this country, that that plan has a realistic possibility of being brought into effect. So it really comes down to a question of, of, of the power of both actual and perceived that the individual racist has. And uh, I would suggest that uh, in this country, because of the history and the historical backdrop that white supremacy sits in, uh, that that is the, the issue that is of, of concern and which poses the problem, as opposed to just the general question of, uh, of intolerance and uh, notions of superiority or supremacy that other people of color might have. Very quickly, I think it, I agree with what Mark, a fellow Mark, said. But I'd also say that who the, the old formulation of racism equals social power plus prejudice really can be very useful. Prejudice, we all have prejudice. You might be prejudiced against me because I'm a fat old bald guy. And that has no consequences to you know my position in the world. Uh, I'm prejudiced against lots of types of food that I don't like. We all have prejudices, but prejudice based against a group of people, when that's expressed by an individual who's member, a member of the white 
population in the United States, it's more likely to be expressive of power and therefore to be detrimental. And that's, that has a lot to do with employment decisions. Because you know those black people, they're really not that smart. And white employers say that to each other. Not all of them, all the time, and it's a, a crime, but there are, as an example of discriminatory intent carried out, that can be carried out by individuals, it is, can be consequential. Now I'm a historian, I'm only qualified to talk about the past. So what I've just said is out of my professional range expertise. I mean, I um, simply, Not simply refer to uh, racism as um, ignorance. You know, I'm in the human resources field, so when I first got into the profession, I saw a lot of people that don't look like me helping people that look like them out. Then I came to realize they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're supposed to help out the fellow man. Far too often, though, in the world of human resources, people look at ways to disqualify someone for an opportunity. I mean, all I wear is bow ties. Unfortunately, if I go to a job interview, as not to present myself as being threatening because there's a perception those in a bow tie could be um, threatening, you know, one to listen to as a style factor. And it's just not, it's this notion that it's not proper to come to an interview in a bow tie. Then you get caught up with people that look like me, automatically assuming because I'm on a bow tie and folks be out on the corner selling bean pies. So it's those type of perceptions, negative perceptions, that put people in a place that not just draws up prejudices, but also racism. But at the end of the day, it all boils down to one word: racism equals ignorance. You know, you can't tell me that because and I used to my open remarks was an actual situation right here on this campus. A student in the chemistry department, the only black student in the classroom, and her counterparts, many of whom are white and or Indian and Asian, feels that she's there just because of affirmative action or because she shouldn't be there. And as it turns out, she's getting the best grades in the class. When it comes to time for a group project, no one invites her. They don't even ask her advice. Little do they know, she's the smartest individual in the class. She happens to be a person of color. So when a student told me about this, and it was ironic that I was asked to be on this panel about two weeks ago, I incorporated it to my opening remarks to show that the reality of ignorance still permeates itself. And this was even before the incident happened last week on my campus. Like that. We still have a long way to go. We'll be celebrating 400 years of being bought to this country against our will. But you still have the majority race feeling that they are superior to us as well as other races. And why? No one is willing to have open conversations about race. Every year they go to Mackinac Island. How the hell can you have a conversation about race in Mackinac Island when you have a predominant community of black people in Southeast Michigan? You know, think about that. I mean, every year, people are fine going to Mackinac Island, having a conversation about race, moderated by a white person, no black people on the panel. That doesn't make sense. What, what I would say is the distinction when I look at, again, we all have prejudice, and with the, with the discussion of, of racism as prejudice versus plus power, is that in, in our in my law firm we get several calls a month from from people uh, predominantly black people that are working and that are experiencing discrimination and we end up having to assess their situation and help to refer the matters out uh, there is prejudice that affects all of us but what i where i'm seeing disproportionately with with black folks is I, as I said, employment, there was a study that was done by my alma mater, University of Chicago. They said that if you had people that applied for jobs and that if they had a black name, they were less likely to be hired than a person with a, with a name that, uh, or, or a resume that did not disclose the racial identity. That's, that, that's the reality. 
Uh, I think the, the distinction is, uh, you know, you look at that situation with the young men that were out there uh, with the mega hats, and they said that there were some what, black Hebrew Israelites that were yelling racial things towards them. And um, I would submit, obviously, it's wrong that the black Hebrew Israelites were yelling out those racist remarks. Um, it's wrong, and they shouldn't have been doing that. But, but, the, but like Mark was saying, just because if he, if he yells those things out, they, or they yell those things out, they don't have the power to do anything. They're just, they're, they're yelling things, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't have the same impact that is if you're a black person and you're driving around in your car, and if you're in the wrong environment, if you're, uh, where, if you're around in an environment where there's a trigger-happy cop, you may die, you know, or even uh, with Trayvon Martin, it wasn't even a cop, it was a, a so-called neighborhood watch person. Uh, it, so when racism, I look at uh, my clients in the neglect system, when you have uh, the disparities, you have a, a higher amount of black children that are coming into the neglect system, and in, I've had situations where with my, I, I've represented black, white, and Hispanic children, but we've had to wait days and days before we can find a black family uh, to take, or not even a black family, a family to take in a little black boy, where you have a, a system that is not valuing black children in the same way that other children are, are being valued. So that's where, and then in the criminal, that's where I'm seeing disparity. We're in the criminal just us system, where I'm seeing uh, predominantly black folk, uh, black men that have mental health issues, drug issues, uh, they have problems uh, that could be addressed elsewhere, but because uh, you know, the new Jim Crow is to lock up uh, black men and increasingly black women uh, and, 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 you know, our system, they were talking about on the radio today, we're, we're making money, the system makes money off of black bodies. And the problem with that is that it was happening at the beginning when, when we were first brought here and it's happening today and, and it's wrong. And, uh, you know, we, you know, we are called the minority here, but we are not the minority in the world, and, it's, and the world looks upon us. They look at America for the example. Um, when you look at what happened in uh, Virginia with the governor, that's, that's another clear example of the distinction with racism. You have a governor that is either in blackface or he's wearing a KKK outfit, and it'd be one thing if it was some, somebody's cousin, and they did, if that's racist in itself, and maybe they, the police should be watching them because they may go out and do some really crazy racist stuff. But you're talking about the governor of the state of Virginia who's in a position of power. He says he's remorseful. And, and that's why I know Jesse Jackson Jr. said, okay, talk is cheap, actions speak louder than words. What about uh, uh, going ahead and, and releasing the, the, the high numbers of African Americans that are incarcerated that have been locked up? That have done their pay their debt to society. Uh, you can apologize all you want, and then when he's apologizing, he's saying, "Oh, black folks are brought here as, and you know, they're indentured servants." Or this this discussion about us being immigrants. I'm not. I'm not a descendant of an immigrant. I'm a descendant of slaves, and and that needs to be brought to the forefront of the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, the second arrival of the African here in the United States, yes. And also, i just like to bring it home with a little bit of a real clarity as to what is happening to our students. I drive down from Toledo every day and I have to worry about my students coming in with their heads hung down. I have to worry about them telling me that they will go to their dorms with a PlayStation and have a futon and tell their roommates, okay, we're all here to share this, and none of the roommates have spoke to them, or none of their white roommates have spoke to them all semester, or responded. To me, racism hurts, and so that's my definition of what racism is. It hurts. Well, um, my next question uh, follows uh, those comments uh, logically. Uh, a recent a few research survey reports that, and I quote, blacks far more than whites say black people are treated unfairly across different realms of life, from dealing with the police to applying for a loan or mortgage, unquote. That survey result goes on to say that, quote, an overwhelming majority of blacks, 88%, say the country needs to continue making changes 
for blacks to have equal rights with whites. But 43% are skeptical that such changes will ever occur, unquote. So dear panelists, from your own standpoint, do these public opinion survey results reflect the realities of social life as they are on the ground? Yes, I, I, they do. You, you were saying that 40% of whites, only 40% of whites? No, 80% of, of, of African Americans say that uh, the country needs to continue to make proper changes and in order for African Americans to have equal rights with whites. And, and but blacks believe that, you know, African Americans are treated unfair across the different realms of life. And do they have a figure for whites? Well, in terms of whites, uh, there's a, actually an, a Pew Research, a 2017 Pew Research survey, which says that a majority of white Americans, uh, specifically 55%, believe that whites face discrimination in the United States. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, with respect to blacks, I mean, it's, it's observed reality. I mean, it's, it's for anyone who's honest, uh, you know, this discrimination actually exists, uh, the pain actually exists, uh, the racism actually exists, it does. Uh, white, the white population, particularly white workers, uh, are, are dealing with something else. Uh, you know, I always say God speaks to us through conscience. And, 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 and conscience <coughs> has, has plagued the white population of the world uh, since uh, the conquest of territories and slavery began. And it has bothered them at a very deep level. And in order to cope with it, uh, they've had to come up with things, including white supremacy. It's not so bad to enslave people, you know, if in fact they're so human, or if they're barbaric or they're animals. It's not so bad to discriminate against them, you know, because they really are less than, they're an other. And, and for that reason, uh, they, they go very deep into denial. And uh, so even though there may be overwhelming evidence of discrimination, I mean, the evidence of police brutality based on race is overwhelming. I mean, every week we have some report about it. But because they have to live in a state of denial about the realities of race, because it bothers their conscience so much, uh, they lie to themselves and, and, and t tell themselves that these changes are not needed, that improvements are not needed, because in fact, uh, not only are people of color uh, in a position where they're no longer facing discrimination, but in fact now it's white people who are being discriminated against. You know, they tell themselves that uh, over and over again, and, and they're convinced of it to their core because it's so important for them to believe it. And when you put that in their face, and I've tried, I've done it, I've, when you put the, the, the raw evidence in their face, uh, they really crumble. I mean, it, it, it's something that's very disturbing to them. So, I mean, I think that's a real phenomenon in this country. I think one of the aspects of culture in the United States is the idea of the American dream. And I think if you look at different periods of history, white Americans have been able to achieve it. And I think one of the really kind of key moments in US history is the period right after World War II, when a lot of white Americans were able to change their economic class. And they were able to achieve, they were able to obtain low interest mortgages and move into increasingly white suburban areas. African Americans were still in cities and were trapped in cycles of poverty and public housing. And this really led to legacies of a huge racial gap in wealth accumulation. And so the, the wealth gap uh, based on race in the United States is incredibly stark. And there are very historical patterns that speak to why these gaps exist. And so I would say that every structure of life in the United States is inherently racist. The system of capitalism in the United States is racist. The system of the carceral state is racist. And so I think if white people aren't confronting those racist structures, they don't acknowledge the, the existence of this. But for African Americans, it's impossible to undo racism unless you explode these power structures. And you bring up some interesting points. So look at today, you have a president and his minions that speak about the unemployment rate of blacks as if we should be proud that it's low. 
when it started in the previous administration, but his followers take that as the gospel. And I think one of the things that we have to do as a people, and I think we do refer to people of color, we have to quit making issues a moment and make them a movement. And I say that one of the most powerful movements in this country was the, boy, the bus boycott back in Montgomery, Alabama. Rosa Parks did not let that situation ask to be moved to the back of the bus. That moment became a movement and pretty much shut down a system of speaking of capitalism in Alabama where they had no choice but to give in. You know, so we have these numerous situations of black males being shot, killed by cops, cops making excuses. Then we have that moment. You had the situation with Michael Brown in St. Louis. That happened. People drove from all over the country to St. Louis. It was a moment. It was never a sustained movement. You had the Baltimore situation. You had the Tamir Rice situation. We have to learn how to not just make it a movement, but also hold people accountable. You have 50% of the blacks in Virginia feel that the current governor did nothing wrong. He should not resign. That is amazing to me. The fact that he admitted that he was one or the other, either the black face or the pointy head, and then changed the story and said he was a Michael, Jan Michael Jackson dancer, that was enough for a lot of people. We have to learn how to make things a movement, hold people accountable, and there's no way, I'm still, every time I see that number, you know, it's typically played the number in the lottery, but I did. But 50% of blacks in Virginia feels that he should stay in office. More whites in Virginia feel to leave office. Let that sink in. Okay, very good. Um, my next question uh, pertains to how we perceive ourselves in society and the consequences of that. And um, for this question, I fall back on the work of uh, Professor Floyd Lover in uh, the book Race and Racism. In it, the professor wrote, and I quote, human history is the story of the emergence of humanity from core African populations with a past rich in migrations, with a genetic code that is uniform and unified with a single human blueprint. The 21st century human genome project highlighted the basic genetic similarities of all Homo sapiens sapiens populations and the arbitrary aspects of race classification. <coughs> so from your standpoint, uh, do you think that the preceding picture uh, of uh, common human ancestry uh, is what uh, pre uh, prevails amongst the majority of Americans? I don't think it's the majority of you amongst most Americans. I think it's the correct view. We are, as Peter Tosh said, we are, it doesn't matter where you come from, you are African. If you're a human being, your ancestors are from Africa. That's a fact established by scientific knowledge research. Uh, so, but most Americans don't, don't have any concept of science. The climate's not warming. It's just a different winter. You know, so, so science and logic and the popular opinion are different than the truth. I think we need to know the truth and teach it, and it's truly important. The human species originated in Africa. One time, one species from Africa. Uh, and I think that's been put pretty well established by the biologists and paleontologists, other scientists, for gener a couple generations. Yeah, I would agree that that's obviously the, the truth, but unless you're a history buff or a person, you know, with an anthropology background or somebody that's highly educated, I would say generally the, the general population, they, they're not having that understanding um, that, that everything originated in Africa, that everybody is basically African, white people are depigmented Africans. I think that we would, would see, if our society, if we could just imagine a world where children are taught that from kindergarten, 
how, you know, they still, they talk about the doll test, and they still do the doll test today, where they have black dolls and white dolls, and you even have black children that will go, you know, who, who's the good doll? They'll go to the white doll. Again, we've got programming. We've got programming that's going on, it's in the music, it's, in, it's on the television, and the programming that, that goes on is that the white is good and bad is, black is bad. I mean, you look at the news, you look at, you look at Detroit, that you, you know, I mean, the images, you constantly see of black, particularly black males, are that black is, you know, these black men are doing this and that they're bad, you know, and that, that's one of the things when I do my juries, uh, and I go in front of juries, and sometimes I have predominantly white jurors or even mixed with black, all of us, again, you look at that implicit bias, all of us are affected by this. So I'll have, if I have a client that's African American, I will have them stand and I'll say, look, there's images out there that are negative about black folk. There's images in the media. I want to have you look at my client and does anybody have, feel that they, are, they already have some images that are going to be negative? Because this is life and, and death. I mean, no, Michigan doesn't have the death penalty, but what I'm saying is my client, you know, I, just, I did a murder trial uh, not too long ago and I, I, every time I have my client stand and I have the jury like, look, look at my client. And I want to make sure you, you, we, there are images out there. And, and it, again, it's, a, it's about an issue of it's reprogramming. It's, uh, with the Dr. Pelton Young, with the programming that she does, she does it with some of the judges, but I would submit it should be done, we should be doing this in uh, multiple facets across the board in society. We are all affected. We are, we've all been programmed, uh, and particularly black folk, we've been programmed to have self, self-hatred. And, and the only way we're going to make a change and make a difference is to, to fix that problem. And then I would submit, you know, if you're white, you know, in, in my line, in my profession, I have uh, white colleagues that have become, they, they were they're upset about the system, they became criminal defense attorneys. I would submit that today, criminal defense, uh, that's one of the, the new frontiers for, for helping people that are impoverished and helping them to, uh, to, to move, to helping to liberate people that are caught up in the prison industrial complex. Um, I would also submit when I'm talking to students, like I was at Western High School and I did a program, a Know Your Rights program. Immigration is a new area. If you feel, you, we all, you are students, you are young people. Again, the adults are, have, messed, have messed it up and it's, it's on y'all. And you know, in scripture it says, let the children leave. It's on y'all to help fix the problem that has been created. So if, if you're a woman and you see, or if you're upset about the way women are treated in society, you may be meant to go and become uh, uh, a, a lawyer that deals with civil rights issues that advocates for women, or a social worker, or a teacher. Um, I feel that uh, when I when I saw what happened with Trayvon Martin, I was I was severely upset about it, and I prayed on it, and that's what motivated me to start doing my programs. I'll be with 115 students tomorrow at Pathways at one of the high schools in Ann Arbor, talking to them about what to do when stopped by the police, how to avoid. Uh, catching a case, possibly helping to save a life. How, so I, we all have our part to play. It's just a matter of getting the knowledge and, and, and meditating, praying on it, and then, and then have the call to action and going forward. Any more comments on that? Okay, before I turn the session over to the audience, uh, I would like to ask uh, a question of a, of a different orientation a question that is uh, focused upon how all of these problems that we've identified might be solved. Uh, in their hope, yes we can, white racial framing and the 2008 presidential campaign. Professors Joe Feli and Adia Harvey Winfield asserted as follows, and I quote, only aggressive civil rights law enforcement by top U.S. officials, which will be new for this country, and continuing anti-racist organization at the grassroots level against the various forms of continuing racial discrimination have a chance of changing the still racist character of the United States of world. What panelists is your take on that recommendation? I, I disagree with it um, for this reason. You know, the problems are much more complicated than that. And, uh, you know, for, for law, for the government to come down and to try and enforce this, try to force racial change, changes in racial attitudes, given the historical context and the actual circumstances in this country, 
it would only inflame things. It would, it would create more resentment among the population that's problematic. The population that's the real problem in this country, and I don't say this you know, to, to uh, attack them, but to identify them as the problem, are white workers. For this reason, there's a historical context. Back during the slave era, many people think that the, uh, the white South uh, was, was monolithic, that everybody was a slave owner, and that all blacks were slaves. The truth is that it was a tiny elite group of white uh, people who owned uh, plantations and, and slave agricultural forces. Uh, because the cost of a slave in today's money was thousands of dollars, and you had to have lots of money in order to staff a plantation. The vast majority of whites in the South were dirt poor. The quality of life that they led was only marginally better than those of the enslaved Africans, only marginally. But even though it would have made sense for them to build an alliance with the enslaved Africans to overthrow the elite, they didn't because they were cynically manipulated by the plantation owners into believing that their, attack, their, their antagonistic relationship should be with the enslaved Africans and their alliance should be with the white uh, elite. Uh, it was the birth of white privilege. Uh, they created for them a certain amount of social capital. They didn't let them in on the, on the material wealth that was to be gained there, but they, they led them to believe that somehow in this caste system that existed in America, that they would always be above these black people. No matter what, they could, they could be assured of that. And that's all that these poor people had. They didn't have anything else. And so they clung to a jealousy. So that you see, in, in, during the Reconstruction period after slavery, when and, uh, uh, in, formerly enslaved Africans did amazing things in terms of their economic development, in terms of their political advances, and in terms of their general rise, and you know, in terms of literacy and education and other things, all of a sudden these poor whites found themselves at the bottom of the barrel, and they were promised that this would not be. And in order to redeem themselves, they created the Ku Klux Klan and began a campaign of terrorism against enslaved, formerly enslaved Africans uh, because of this resentment and this jealousy. And it has been there since that time. And politicians and other leaders who are, 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 are demagogues and tyrants have recognized it and they've exploited it. You know, Ronald Reagan exploited it uh, by you know, using code words like law and order, basically saying to these white workers, I'm going to put these people back in their place when they were rising up in the cities. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, George, George Bush has used it, even Bill Clinton used it, uh, you know, when he started you know, targeting uh, you know, so-called welfare to Queens and Sister Soldier and all of these other things, uh, you know, these predator, you know, these, these gang predators or whatever it is that Hillary made reference to. I mean, they were, play, they were playing to that. They knew that this, this population felt threatened because of what was happening. The master of it is Donald Trump, uh, because he recognized that these people were freaking out because their quality of life had been taken away, not by people of color, but by major corporations who relocated industries out of the country and had closed down certain others, and they, they felt economic fragility, and they really felt that they were in trouble. And so, what he did was to say the demographic projections are going to change, you're going to be in the minority now, we'll build a wall to, to freeze the, the population. These are the people who have been desperately confused historically and who need to be straightened out. But that's not going to be done by force. It needs to be done by people like them who are willing to take on that challenge and take on that task. And nobody has been willing to do that. You know, I'm sorry for the long answer, but I think it's really critical you know, to, to what's going on in this country. Until that problem is solved, there is no hope for there to be any greater racial understanding because they are so deep into this confusion, so deep into denial, that they will listen to nothing and no one, uh, you know, until they decide on their own that they really should. That's interesting. Um, I'm going to ask you this This is a country that is known for violence and racism. At 6.20 this morning at my job, someone come knocks on my door, knocks to my office, to let me know that there's an issue out on the uh, line. Again, this is 2019. 
Solomon makes a statement that he tells the slaves on the line, do their jobs better, their line will not be successful. To even use the word slaves in the workplace is amazing. But this is what has been uh, happening since you have a person that has given people the freedom to think that be going back to 1619. That's the mindset. When you have people calling police on kids selling lemonade at a, a, um, a lemonade stand, kids selling water on the corners to make ends meet, you know, some of the most impoverished communities are urban areas. Black people going to a park to have a barbecue, getting the police called on them. I mean, this is, you know, in 2019, we're dealing with this, and we've been dealing with this since the person that currently occupies the White House started his campaign. Yes, we can all talk about Barack Obama and his Make America, I uh, mean, not Make America, um, change and hope, hope and change. We can always, we can all ask a question, did hope and change come? But his phonetics that he used, and the catchphrase, make America great again, are two entirely different things. Neither one is playing what their catchphrases were. But there's more coding in MAGA than there is in open change. The media let him put away with it. No one thought that on November the, um, 6th, 7th, 8th of 2016 that when you woke up the next day, that's who your president was gonna be. But the media created the character when he tried to go in a different direction to get people to understand he wasn't the one, it was too late. And that's how he got elected. And people began to think, and by the way, the person that used to slave where it didn't take much to realize that it was a white person. But you just can't say that in today's age. And I mean, I'm not looking forward to going to work tomorrow to deal with this because um, the company is predominantly uh, black workers and we get all kinds of reverse discrimination claims levied against us, but it is what it is. You do not say, that we, it's like screaming fire in the movie theater. There's a certain things you do not do. And for someone to use a term like that, it's a result of being so comfortable with the person in the White House that they feel that's a new day and age. And unfortunately, and as Mark said, you know, it's gonna take you know, some type of uprising but it might be the wrong type of uprising. I mean, we are so-called the best place to live in the world. But if you pay attention to what has been happening lately, again, as I spoke about earlier, a movement is an amazing thing. You had hundreds of thousands of people marching in Venezuela a few weeks ago. What is that gonna happen here for the righteousness of how this society that we live in should be? And that's the million dollar question. Um, <clears throat> is there anyone in the audience who would like to ask a question? <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Ho. I'm an alumni here, proud alumni. My name is Van. And I'd just like to put this out to the panel in general. I think that, um, and I've attended literally hundreds of these types of forums. And um, Stokely Carmichael said that he was reiterating what H. Rat Brown said, either part of the problem or part of the solution. And everybody has to fight this battle where they are. It's like golf, you gotta play the ball where it lies. In terms of this university, this would be my suggestion. Now, wouldn't it be nice if a student from Eastern Michigan, everybody was required to take some kind of uh, Africology study class for graduation. Now, if if the university was true to its edicts and want to address certain problems, I think that that's not an end all be all, but that's that's a start. But not only that, you're required to take a class in woman studies, Asian studies, whatever studies it takes to be a complete individual in this society. So I'd just like to put that uh, question out to the panel and see how it was done. It's interesting, but I guess it's like 
you're a kid and your mother or father is trying to get you to eat broccoli, asparagus, whatever. There's just certain things you, I mean, it sounds good in theory, but there's certain things you cannot do. Why? Why? Well, for one, it's a public university. You cannot, there's only 120 credit hours that it takes to graduate. You can't legislate how someone spends their money taking class to graduate. Yes, you can. No, so you can't. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I'm one of these old dogs. See, people do things and then they justify it later. And that's been my experience in life. I'm six years older than Santa Claus now. So I understand that. So until uh, uh, institutions like universities, banks, jobs, uh, people on different jobs and different institutions, and that's what the rubber meets the road. You have to face it and deal with some things that that would start these kind of dialogues on an everyday basis. As long as everybody just kicks back and says we can't do it, you know, it's good to sit up in a think tank and, and, and pontificate. That ain't helping baby and, and, and them on the other side of water tower. That ain't helping you. It just ain't. So again. Uh, that was just my statement. I'm saying to it, I just want to reaction. My reaction, man, is versions of that are done here and elsewhere, and they don't address the main problem for a number of reasons. You pick countries about whatever the course should be, whether, and I'm in favor of having a mandatory requirement in agriculture. My opinion on that does not matter to the decision making process. I'm in favor of that. I, I double the composition. Requirements as well. Students should write better. And I, I'm an educator. I believe classes are important. I think some U.S. history is important too. An African American history, but they don't. They don't change people as much as we would like to think. Any other response to that? Yeah, I mean, as I, I don't know if you were here, Mr. Lovins, earlier, but yeah, I said I think that. I mean, that the, especially having my background in anthropology, I think that that it would, it's like, it's essential in this world. If you want to be competitive in this world, you want to know about other cultures. I mean, I think that with the way, you know, I took French. I majored in, uh, I did French in undergrad. I went to France, and uh, which was great. Uh, but in high, and I took a semester of Spanish. But in hindsight, with the way I look at the demographics, and you, the more you learn about culture, about other people's culture, about your own culture, the more marketable you are in in the world economy, you know. If if the if the the world is uh, four billion Asian, then it would it would make the university more marketable to have more. Uh, it makes you more marketable to have know more about culture. When you're going into the certain environments, you're able to speak the lingo, understand the culture. You're, you're able to have. Uh, a better reference point. So I, I you know, as, again, I think it, it, it should be uh, culture plus. It should be, it, it, it benefits us all. And it, and I think it should start, you know, as I said, I think it should be starting in kindergarten. It should be starting earlier than the university level because by the time you're at the university level, you already have so many notions and concepts that are, are affecting you. So uh, it, sh it should be culture plus and it, and um, I don't know if any of you have seen that movie, Race, uh, which, which is the Jesse Owens story. And as I was watching that movie, I'm looking at you know, what Jesse Owens went through and how he was able to excel. And I think to myself, what if we lived in a society where everybody was given the opportunities? What if, you know, we, you know I know they talk about Bernie Sanders and this warned that education should be free. I believe it should be free, especially if you were a descendant of a slave and you helped to build this country and you still, you still going through what we're doing. I'll be on, I'm going to be on the bandwagon. That's how I'm going to be. I, th I definitely think we should, I should, I, my student loans should be forgiven. All right, they should be forgiven. But I'm just saying, uh, you you benefit from letting, giving education and opportunities to everybody. What if there's somebody out there who has a cure for cancer, but because of our, we limit ourselves because of our racism, our sexism, our classism, we limit ourselves. We could be so much better as a society and advance everybody in this, if, as humans, if if we did not uh, if we weren't limited by our our the, the racism and the prejudices. Yeah, I just want, I just wanted to piggyback on, on what you were saying. I came from a university, Bowling Green State University, that did make it mandatory, and there is a different feel in a campus that does make it mandatory to take culturally diverse classes or 
classes that will enrich your understanding of ethnicity. Yeah, so I, I, I think that's, that's great. And, she, and you did say that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. County Commissioner Ricky Jefferson, District of Slanty, Slanty Township, and also from the other side of Watertown. Four generations. Uh, what you're talking about, about the cultural education of our, of our students, of all races. I mean, I run into, as a minister, people who are trying to better their lives by coming out of the court system, coming out, out of drugs and all these kind of things. And the institutions that are there for them do not have cultural training. And I find a lot of the, the people that do not succeed are basically those who are not understood in their culture. Therefore, they're looked at as problem people, trouble people. And so, also, Mr. Fancher was talking about understanding of my supremacy. If you don't understand that, you won't understand racism. It's, a, it's three classes in white supremacy. There's white, elite, and then there's white, and then there's non-white. And non-white means that you're in the class. So if you don't understand that, you'll never know how to deal with that problem. So my question is, is how can we deal with the, the uh, cultural uh, education, the lack of cultural education? Because even as I talk about this now, I think about when I'm studying some uh, addiction courses, uh, there were some cultural classes that I took, but they weren't quite in depth because all the material that we had were dealing with cases from the white middle class. So that is something that is really a problem. How can we, <coughs> as he was said, implement that? Because evidently, government is not going to take care of it. Uh, we're trying to do it at the county level. But we know, just like I was in my class in 76, business law with some students who fathers were lawyers and doctors, and we were talking about uh, finding some ways to deal with civil rights. And those students who, who they were then in 76 said that that was a racial discrimination. So that's been the narrative all along, to find a way to make it look like <coughs> people are the ones that are being discriminated and when we as a race say that we're uh, people who, who love ourselves, it looks like we hate black people, but that's not the case. So how do we get that understanding in our colleges to get uh, cultural uh, training for our, for our social workers, and our doctors, our, our business community? Uh, can I ask for clarification? Do you mean um, cultural education for white community or cultural education for communities of color? Right. White communities? You know, I think that's a long-term proposition, and, and my personal belief is that uh, the white community will never be prepared to embrace whatever training we might get for them right now until they are self-motivated to embrace it. They've got to have a reason to want to embrace it, and right now they don't. They have no reason at all, because they still regard communities of color as negligible, unimportant, uninfluential, and lacking in power. And so, um, you know, my brother here uh, invoked the name of Sylvia Carmichael, who later went on to be known as Kwame Ture, uh, you know, who understood that this whole notion of getting along is not going to happen until we have power. So he took it a, a, a notch higher than just black power. You know, he talked about Pan-Africanism, uh, which dealt with the question of, of African people uh, controlling mule power. Power doesn't come from just money. You know, there are a lot of wealthy people who have zero power. You know, so Oprah Winfrey has lots of money, but if she says the wrong thing or does the wrong thing, she loses it tomorrow. You know, it, it doesn't take much. Power comes from control of resources, like oil, mm. gold, diamonds, boxing, uh, you know, coal tank. You know, these are things that, that make the world turn. And if, 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 if the people is have possession of those things, they call, they call it to them. And many people who formerly disrespected them and didn't want to give them the time of day, all of a sudden find a reason for needing to understand these people because they got something that they need and that they want. And so, you know, in terms of our struggle, you know, if it is focused more on trying to uh, achieve genuine uh, proprietorship, ownership, title, 
uh, to the resources of the world, specifically in Africa, uh, then I think that that gets us further along uh, toward that uh, point when you know people look at us differently. And, and even the white community that formerly disrespected us and didn't have much to think of us says, you know what, we really need to get to know these people. And there's a, uh, there's a uh, piece, an opinion piece in British Magazine titled The Miseducation of Michigan, How State Fails Kids in Black History. This is uh, Black History course is being taught at Birmingham Groves High School. And that's another example of you forcing something on individuals, and if they're not ready to receive it, then the school is doing it to appease the black students by how receptive are the white, are, are the white students who want to receive it. And it's a great uh, piece if you get a chance to Bridge Magazine, check it out, written by Chelsea Pratt Dossie. You know, so in my opinion, the same thing will happen on college and university campus. Yes, you may have taken the course, you might get an A plus out of the course, but you did what you need to do to maintain your GPA. How receptive will you be to go out to the real world and utilize what you learned in that class to bring black people into your life and appreciate blackness into your life? Where did you start to die? That's the same point. Because I was going to start from a few years ago. We can talk about terms of dialogue. Uh, no, no. What you know about 400 years ago? Oh, yeah. If you already know what's happening right now. I know now. my history and I know what's happening right now. So I, I'm not going to debate, but again, <laughs> I have an opinion you have to This is a little bit more toward Van's question, but I've been having conversations with students and um, faculty members and hopefully at some point administrators. I think. Once, one way to start would be to have some kind of anti-racist or undoing racism curriculum as part of orientation. Because I think that needs to be something that students encounter in the first moment that they come on Eastern's campus. Michigan is a deeply segregated state. And I think it's really important for Eastern to be very upfront about its diversity and the values that it stands for. Right now, the, the um, the orientation curriculum has a sexual violence component, which is really, really important, but we don't have a racism component. I agree with what my colleague, Professor Murphy, just said about orientation. I'd also like to say that Bridge Magazine article that Eric just mentioned is really good. It's a critique by this parent of the so-called black history course that her child took at, I forget the name of the high school, Groves. And it's, and then she, and there are pictures of the syllabus, and it is a joke, right? in terms of content. Thank you. Um, I'll leave Frank. How do we framework our efforts to show that a better understanding on race and racism is best for all of us? That's been back to really, really difficult questions. Because a lot of people do not believe any kind of anti-racism is best for all of us. These tend to be people who are pale, white people. Uh, not exclusively, and not universally, that's very important to understand. But not everybody is against dismantling white supremacy because they benefit from it. Yes. Can we have full equitable competition for these jobs when there's a limited number of jobs? Far better that we make sure that these jobs go to the people who kind of look like me. I'm saying that sarcastically. Okay. And I just want you to understand that I'm not endorsing white privilege in the job, the hiring process, but it, it is a problem thing. So it's a, it's a good question, but it's a hard question. How to, how to dismantle what is structurally beneficial for some people and detrimental for others. That is a very hard thing, especially since our American culture, as I tried to, tried to say in my opening remarks, there's this what prevailing idea of the white, good white binary, the, the bad good binary. Good people are against racism, but 
But actually, bad people or self-interested people perpetuate a lot of the racial inequalities uh, in our society. So it's a really tough question. And I think it's going to be brilliant for <coughs> people like yourselves, like yourself, Desmond, not all guys like myself to solve that. But it can be solved. And it's imperative that we undertake it, uh, dismantling that. Thank you. Desmond, I think that, uh, like I talked about earlier, Jane Elliott has some, if you go to her website, she has some exercises that can be done. Maybe bring her to campus and have some workshops, have Tim Weiss come onto campus and do some workshops and uh, have the understanding. I mean, in our class, what uh, we're, we're talking about just the history of racism and reconstruction and the Southern strategy. We're going through the cycles. We're talking about the Southern strategies employed with, during the time of Jim Crow. And then you have the Southern strategy comes up again with Nixon. And now you have again the Southern strategy with Trump. You have Trump saying things to, to keep uh, black, Hispanic, white, Asian people apart. Uh, it's divide and conquer. Uh, but the reality is that if we don't come together, look at the environment. It's, it's, it's not, I mean, okay, yeah, maybe immediately there'll be some benefits from white privilege, you'll have a job, but if you don't have a planet, you're not gonna have a job. So uh, it's, it's, it's having that understanding. You've got political figures out there right now that are running for office, making them accountable, making them, uh, having them to understand that uh, it, it's, it's, you know, that you, we have this issue with uh, politicians that get into office and then they say one thing, and then they get into office, and they do something else. It's about making them accountable. Uh, in the context of uh, police brutality, it's about making the police accountable, about making the prosecution accountable. Um, right now, if you look at the way the police are trained, they have like a black image that they're shooting. They're, it's like shoot to kill. That is warped in itself. And then we wonder why we keep seeing these these killings of, of, of black folk. And then you, you have situations like Philando Castile, where you clearly see there's clear evidence. He was shot, the cop was trigger happy, the jury got the case, the jury found the cop not guilty because the cop talked about he was scared, he was scared of black folk. And so I'm saying it's, it, there's just all these injustices in society and, and the cycle has, we have to end the cycle or it's going to be to the detriment of all of us. I actually think that the challenge in this is, is uh, getting people to listen to it. Framing it is not that hard, I don't think. Because the fact is that uh, all of this could have been solved a uh, long time ago if white workers understood who they are and their circumstances. If back during slavery, white workers had formed an alliance with enslaved Africans and overthrown the elite, we wouldn't have the problems that we have today. And if you go each, at each phase of history, if you see that they recognize their true class interests, if they recognize their true circumstances, and they build an alliance with the people that they're fighting desperately against, problem solved, problem solved. So that's how you frame it. Uh, it's just a question of getting them to listen. And they're not going to listen until they, they have some reason to listen. Um, uh, before I may continue with the audience, uh, there's a question that uh, just uh, came to my mind. Um, and I would, I would like to direct that question to uh, uh, Tony McFunction. Is there a legal definition of racism? We have been intellectualizing about it. We have uh, talked about uh, it in terms of how, as a social phenomenon, it impacts upon uh, individuals and their life chances. But at the federal level, state level or local level, is there an explicit legal definition of racism as a malignant phenomenon? I, I, I'm not aware of any, and I think it's for practical reasons that, there, that one does not exist. Uh, laws that uh, govern race uh, speak in terms of, of conduct and intent, uh, which is how the law is, is, is structured. You know, it's, it's always based on those two elements, certainly in criminal law, but even in a civil context sometimes, uh, it's a question of what do people intend and what have they done. And so it speaks in terms of discrimination. It, it doesn't ever speak in terms of racism. Uh, so even in international law, there's the International uh, Convention for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, 
Uh, if you go through it, you don't see them defining racism per se, but they do talk about discrimination on the basis of, of race and, and other things. Uh, there is also a, um, a provision in it that talks, uh, that, that talks against uh, those who espouse a doctrine of racism, but they don't define what racism is. And, um, you know, I mean, I think as a practical matter, it, it, it's probably a good idea because uh, it would be easy to uh, practice racism, uh, you know, with, you know, by, by molding it, shaping it in such a way that it avoids any type of specific legal requirements that are there. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Kofa, when I think about that and I've been pondering that question, I often think, yeah, we, we, we do. Don't we? We discuss it all the time in class. Look at my students looking at me. But we do. We talk about it all the time. We have the Constitution, the 13th Amendment, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. Why don't we just put that in practice? Why don't we just do that? Isn't that what it says? Yeah, and I would submit, um, when the Dow incident happened, uh, I, on this issue about racism and discrimination, uh, what, what came to mind is the issue of ethnic intimidation. So what I did is I printed out the statute for my class, and um, the statute, that's a statute here in Michigan, and so ethnic intimidation is a person is guilty of ethnic intimidation if that person maliciously and with specific intent to intimidate or harass another person because of the person's race, color, religion, gender, or national origin, does any of the following, causes physical contact with another person, damages, destroys, or defaces any real or personal property of another person's threatens by word or act. And so when I look at that, that the whole concept of the, the dial being put in somebody's, uh, the bathroom, and uh, just the way, the whole way the situation is handled in the sense that it's, it's coined as a, a prank, you know. And then, again, you got the stuff going on with Jesse Smollett, right? People, he just got arrested, okay? What if he just came out and was like it was a prank? You know, the Chicago police, they're not laughing. The, the black students here, they're not laughing about this Frank, you know, you, you gotta think about black folk, we have the history of being lynched, of being raped, being brutalized, and then to have to come into your, your bathroom and you see a doll hanging, that, that is traumatic. I think the, the university should have trauma counseling uh, for, particularly for the black students, but for everybody, there should be cultural sensitivity training. Uh, what I would like to see with the, the person that did it, again, I have a criminal defense attorney, disclaimer, um, I want it, you know, yes, I think that based on what I've seen, I know that they're investigating, that does meet the standard for ethnic intimidation. I want to see uh, that, but I'm, you know, again, it's a student. It's probably not a person that's 25, the adult brain hasn't fully matured. So work out some kind of situation where they do some kind of diversion program. They have to do cultural sensitivity training. Just like you see here with, uh, you saw Nasser, you had all the victims of Nasser had to get up in, in the room and he had to hear that and he talked about he couldn't deal with that, but, but he had to hear it because there were big, the same thing should happen with this situation. You should have that person have to, have to listen, to have to have to understand, and, and really, again, um, I'm about redemption and having an understanding. Where Where is it coming from? It's not something that just children and, and students are still children, they are taught to hate. So that came from somewhere. Where did it come from? How do we eliminate it? How do we have the person do some community service work, talking with the black students here, uh, maybe doing some stuff with the black high schools, have them, it, the, the best way I think to solve the problem, not to just discard the person, send them away, lock them up. That's not the, the way we heal our society. The way we heal society our society of this racism is to come to an understanding of where is it coming from? You know, with the Me Too movement too, I see, I, I have a nephew and I look at a lot, it's like crazy out there. If you're a man, I, I'm like, I don't even know what I would do if I was a man. You can't even look at somebody the wrong way and they might say something. And I feel like sometimes it just, it just goes too far. You should have, you know, have a dialogue, have a restorative circle where people can sit and talk about, well, this is how I felt and, and work, work to getting at the, the crux of where did it come from and how do we heal the problem. And I mean, I would submit that had you guys had some cultural sensitivity classes or made it mandatory, uh, 
that you probably wouldn't have a dial incident. So it's, it's about prevention. It's just like, why do I do my what to do and stop by the police? Because I'm tired of seeing a lot of black folk coming through the criminal justice system. I'm tired of seeing them getting killed by the police. And I'm hoping that maybe something I say, maybe something one of the police officers on the panel or the judges, maybe something that somebody says will stop that from happening. Prevention, to me, is the best way to, to cure uh, the problem. Regarding the doll incident, the university's first email to the whole community, to students, faculty, and staff, mentioned the word racism in the middle of the fourth line. Racist. And that was mentioned in the context of quoting the student who put it up, her, her denial that it was racist. It was just a prank, it wasn't racist. And 30, almost 36 hours later, the university because everybody on campus had seen videos and pictures of it and thought it was racist. Because most people on campus are intelligent. They can recognize hateful, symbolic racist violence when they see it, even as top university administrators cannot. So 36 hours later, an email directed to the office of the president mentioned racism in the first sentence and denounced racism. It also went on to say there are a lot of concern for the involved individual the person who did it, presumably what was meant there. But, but that was a shift in 36 hours because of a lot of criticism. And it, and it was in the national press as well. So Eastern got, Eastern cleaned up its public statements under pressure. And every bit of progress against Racism results from pressure. Pressure. That's what Frederick Douglass and Ella Baker and Dr. King were all about. Agitating and demanding change. And that's what we should be about. Thank you. Well, on that note, I would like to say a big thank you to all of us. And I would like us to uh, give a round of applause to our panel. Thank you very much for coming and I wish you a safe journey back to your desk. Thank you.